Hello. We're currently doing a series on eternal life. What's next? And we're talking about heaven. We're talking about death. We're talking about all those topics because, of course, they're all, you know, very much related, right? So last week, we gave a simple and brief timeline of what's going to be happening in the various times throughout of throughout history, both the past and the future. And the future, of course, is what we're really focusing on. But uh, we talked about what happened when a person dies during the Old Testament time, and also what happens today if someone dies, and we're gonna go into greater detail on that today. And then we talked about the millennium, and then the future heaven and earth. And I just want to encourage you that if you're listening to this series, it would be good to listen to every one of them because they do all build upon one another and, uh, and they're, they're all very much related. So this week, we're going to be talking about present heaven. That is the time between the resurrection and when Jesus comes back. That's the resurrection of Jesus. And it's uh, for those who die... There's a choice. They're either going to go to the present heaven, and I call it present heaven because it's going to be a little bit different from eternal heaven, okay? And uh, so they're either going to go to present heaven or to Hades, and we'll talk about both of those. Okay, so one of the things we really want to focus in on in this session is what will present heaven be like? You know, in other words, from now until the time that Jesus comes back. And of course, there's always a lot that we don't know. But we can look at various passages and we can determine a whole lot. So here's some of the things that we know. First of all, and this is probably the most important, we will be in the presence of Jesus. We see that many places. Uh, Philippians 1 verse 23, For I am hard pressed from both directions, says Paul having the desire to depart and be with Christ in his presence, for that is much better. Or in Acts 7, we see Stephen, who is in the, you know, he's being stoned. And uh, in, in verse 55 and verse 56, it says, uh, And being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Now this actually happened, you know, uh, minutes before he actually died, but God sort of, like we talked about last week, sort of just opened up the curtains and gave him a glimpse of what was happening. And he, and he said, behold, I see the heavens opened up and the son of man standing at the right hand of God. And that was where he was going. Psalm 16, we talked about this last week, just very briefly, but it talks about the presence of God. And he's talking about, first of all, in verse 10, he's talking about, my soul's not going to be abandoned to Sheol or to Hades. And verse 11, he says, you will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. And in your right hand, where Jesus is, there are pleasures forever. So in his presence, there's going to be joy to the fullest. There's going to be perfect peace. There's going to be an understanding of spiritual things, heavenly things. You know, Ephesians uh, 1.3, we don't have it up here, but it says, he, it's, it talks about how we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Well, we're going to be we're going to be uh, we're going to be there. We'll be experiencing every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And of course, Ephesians one makes it clear that that begins here, but it's in its fullness when we are with Jesus. So the most important thing about present heaven is that we will be with Jesus. A second thing, we will remember events and people here on earth. Yes, our memory is going to stay with us. And it's probably going to be a perfect memory. We'll be able to remember things that maybe now we don't. Uh, how do we know that? Well, in Luke 16, it talks about, you know, we talked about this a little bit last week, the story that Jesus gave 
of the rich man and Lazarus. And, uh, you know, the rich man, he could still remember his brothers. He was concerned about them. So he, even though he was in Hades, and certainly if you can do that in Hades, you certainly can do that in heaven. The transfiguration. We see that in Luke 9, where all of a sudden Elijah and Moses appear with Jesus. You know the story, and Peter says, oh, let's build three tabernacles. And of course, he hears the voice, you know, from heaven, you know, but uh, they were, Moses and Elijah were talking to Jesus, and it was obvious that they knew what was going on from their point of view. Another passage we could kind of look at would be in 1 Samuel 28. You can look at these a little bit later, you know, verses 16 to 19, more or less. But Saul, after Samuel the prophet had died, King Saul was, he was just, he was frustrated and he goes to a medium and says, can you call up Samuel the prophet for him? I need to talk to him. And of course, that was uh, strictly prohibited. And the medium said, no, no, I can't do that. You know, and the, Saul kind of uses kingly powers to insist that she do that. And all of a sudden, Samuel appears. And it's kind of a bizarre story. But Samuel gives Saul a rebuke for disturbing him. And then it's obvious if you read the passage, Samuel knows what's going on in earth. In fact, he says, not only in the past, he knows what's going to happen too, because he said, listen, I can tell you right now, you and all your sons are going to die tomorrow on the battlefield. And of course, uh, and then all of a sudden, you know, Samuel disappears and Saul was very much afraid. And guess what happens the next day? Saul and his sons were, were killed. So yes, when we're in heaven, when we're in that other world, we will remember events. We will remember people here on earth. Third, and a lot of these overlap, we can see what is happening here on earth. Um, again, there's a number of passages. I'm just giving a couple. Uh, Revelation chapter 6 is probably a good example of this. And uh, maybe starting in verse 9. And we know, of course, this is before Jesus comes back. It says, When the Lamb broke the fifth seed, seal, I saw underneath the altar, under, underneath the altar, the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. So he's talking about the martyrs. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? It's obvious that they were kind of watching. And they were, and there was given to each of them a white robe, and they were told that they should rest a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed even as they had been would be completed also. So we see there that they're very much aware of what's going on. In fact, they're saying, Lord, can't you do something? Uh, Hebrews 12, uh, verse 1. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Here the picture is that the great cloud of witnesses, and what are they witnessing? They're witnessing us. And they are kind of watching the events unfold. And they are, actually, I think they're probably watching with great anticipation and, and concern on earth that everything gets completed. They were speaking, you know, especially there we see that in Revelation 6. They even be, in Revelation 6, they even, it even says, they're crying out to the Lord, which has kind of made a lot of people uh, suggest that maybe one of the things that we're going to be doing in this present heaven is uh, just calling out to the Lord to, you know, to, to finish his work here on earth. And it's obvious that they have a concern for justice and, 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 and tribution, don't they? You know, that they, they want the consequences of sin and judgment to, you know, to, to come there. We can also see in another place, 
Uh, and this is maybe a little bit more encouraging time. In Luke 15, verse 10, it's talking about, um, well, I'll just read it. It says, in the same way I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, I probably have been guilty of kind of saying, oh, yeah, when someone comes in, the angels are rejoicing. But it says, no, it says there's joy in the presence of angels because we're going to be there with the angels. And I think the implication is that we're the ones rejoicing, those of us who are in present heaven. When we see people, probably especially loved ones, you know, come into a relationship with Christ and give their life, there's rejoicing, you know, and and in the presence of angels means, yeah, we're, we're in heaven at that time. So, uh, you know, uh, it's obvious that we are watching events down here on earth, okay? Another thing we can say, just from the things that we've already kind of, passages we've already looked at, we will recognize one another in heaven. We'll be able to communicate with one another, you know? Uh, and I know that's a question a lot of people ask, you know? Luke 16, the story of Lazarus and the rich man, they're talking back and forth. Now, some of you may be saying, you know, I thought this is kind of obvious. Why are you talking about that? Because there are false ideas about death and heaven that are circulating even in the body of Christ in Christian circles. For example, there's some people who talk about soul sleep. And they kind of get this from one verse in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where it refers to the people who have died as asleep. But I think it's, if you read it in context, it's not talking literally sleeping. Uh, you know, into Jesus comes back. Uh, actually, some of the reformers back during the Reformation, actually quite a few of them, uh, propagated this idea of soul sleep. Uh, uh, today, there's uh, some um, circles within charismatic Christianity that uh, are promoting this idea. The Seventh-day Adventists promote this idea. But really, as we've seen, there's, there's no evidence of that. In fact, to the contrary, there's evidence in the scriptures that we're not going to be sleeping. We're going to be witnessing. We're going to be talking to one another. We're going to be concerned about justice and what's happening here on earth. Uh, another false idea that was especially propagated during the Catholic Church era in the Middle Ages, and it still holds on, that somehow, that unless you are really righteous, you're going to go to purgatory. And purgatory is going to be sort of a place where you are going to have to wait. It's like a waiting room. And depending on how many sins that you had, you might have... Uh, you know, you might have one year of waiting. You might have 600 years of waiting. In fact, that was a big issue during the Reformation, wasn't it? Because uh, the Catholic Church started, uh, if you gave extra money, then they would limit, they would kind of knock down your time in purgatory, at least until you started sinning again and kind of built it back up. And I think probably one of the reasons why a lot of the Reformation, um, some great, uh, men and women of God, you know, went into the soul sleep. It was purgatory was sort of the uh, the thing that the church taught. So it was a big jump to go to, you know, oh no, we're going to be alive. We're going to be we're gonna, we're we're going to be awake. We're going to be witnessing. And so this was sort of like an in between type of thing. So whenever someone talks to you about soul sleep or purgatory, because there's still pockets both within the Catholic Church and even outside the Catholic Church that talk about purgatory. That is not biblical. When we die and we know Jesus, we go to be in the presence of God. And there's going to be communication. There's going to be, we're going to be able to remember, we're going to be alive. We're not going to be asleep. Okay, a few other things. Let's just kind of say real briefly. Uh, we've sort of mentioned this already, but present heaven is not eternal heaven. They're different, and we're going to see that in the weeks to come. They are different. Number six, it's important to know that we will not have our resurrected bodies yet. When does that happen? 
That happens when Jesus comes back. Now, there are some Bible scholars who say we will probably have some type of temporary bodies. And that could be true. They point out where in the Transfiguration, for example, Elijah and Moses, they had some type of, um, you know, temporary body, at least when they came here. Or in Revelation 6, that passage we looked at before were the martyrs, you know, that they were wearing white robes. Well, to wear clothing, you've got to have some type of a body. It may not be the resurrected body. In fact, we know it's not. But it's, and we also know it's not the body here that we had on earth because it's in the ground, decaying. So there could be some type of a temporary type of body we don't know. But we do know it's not our resurrected immortal bodies. Uh, speaking of things that are not in present heaven, we will not have major responsibilities like we do in the millennium and in the age after that. And uh, so that's that's important to kind of know. We're not gonna be reigning with Christ until the millennium come. You know, we will, just not yet. And then seven, and I think this is kind of an important one here too. Martyrs, it's obvious, if you read the book of Revelation, even that passage in Revelation six, martyrs seem to have a special place in heaven in present heaven. They are honored greatly. Now, we don't know what that means, but we do know it was so much of, it's so much of a, that it was, a, there's a very much of a focus in the early church. In fact, a lot of the early church fathers, you know, they would pray for, it would be their desire that, Lord, when I leave this earth, let it be as a martyr. And we don't hear much about that anymore today, do we? Uh, uh, I guess we just live in a different world, but maybe that should be something that we should look at again a little bit more closely. Because it is true that martyrs, it appears, have a very special place in heaven. We don't know what. Okay, so that's present heaven. What about present Hades? Now, we talked about last time that Hades in the Old Testament time was, it was divided into two sections, one for the righteous and one for the wicked or the selfish. And at the resurrection, Jesus took those of the righteous. He brought them up to present heaven. Hades is not the hell that we read about later. Hades is actually thrown into hell later after the millennium. We'll talk about that later. But what do we know about Hades? And first of all, I'd just like to say that Hades or hell are mentioned, I think, 56 times in the scriptures, Old Testament and New Testament. Compare that to over 500 times that heaven is mentioned. And many of those are stories and even parables. So about 10 times as much. So hell certainly is not the focus of the scriptures like heaven is. Now, however, having said that, that doesn't mean that Hades and later hell are not real. They are. The Old Testament speaks of it. Usually it refers to the Hebrew word Sheol. Jesus speaks of it. The apostolic writers speak of it. And, and by the way, one of the... Um, one of the principles of, of um, studying the scriptures is every important doctrine, everything that really deserves our focus in the scriptures, you'll be able to see it in the Old Testament. You'll be able to see Jesus talk about it. And you'll also see it in the apostolic writers, the rest of the New Testament. And that is certainly true here for Hades. Old Testament talks about it, Jesus and the apostolic writers. Actually, uh, Jesus probably refers to hell more than, or to Hades more than the Old Testament and the rest of the New Testament. So it is important. It is something we need to understand. It makes us feel uncomfortable, but we, we've got to look at it. So what do we know about Hades? Well, first of all, we know that Hades 
is a place of torment. Uh, Luke 16, that's the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Uh, if you look at verse 23, uh, it talks about now, um, it says, In Hades, he, talking about the rich man, lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away. So it's a place of torment. Actually, the next verse, verse 24, it's not up here. It actually uses the word agony. So it is a place of torment. Matthew 8. And of course, there's many passages, quotes from Jesus. I'm just going to mention just a couple here. But uh, Matthew 8. Uh, let's kind of look at verse 11 and 12. It says, I say to you that many will come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom, meaning that some of the people who were of Jewish descent, will be cast out into the outer dark darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I don't know about you, but that sounds like torment to me. And, and by the way, Jesus often throws in that phrase, in the outer darkness. I'm not sure what that means, but it sounds like a really, really dark place. There's no light, and there's gnashing of teeth and weeping. Matthew 22, we see something very similar. Starting in verse uh, 13, it says, uh, uh, and this is part of a parable, then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness. There it is again. You know, in that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So it's going to be a place of torment. We also know that Hades is a place separated from God, separated from his life, separated from his creation. It's in the outer darkness. We also know that it's the opposite of heaven. In other words, there's no peace, there's no joy, there's no hope, there's no light. Actually, everything that heaven has, there's an absence of in hell. There's going to be guilt that's unbearable. There's going to be condemnation. There's going to be regret. Uh, you know, in heaven, one of the things that we're going to see this as we start talking about the millennium and the new earth, one of the characteristics of heaven, especially eternal heaven, is that there's a the community of brothers and sisters that God always desi desired for the people of God to be. That That's going to characterize present or eternal heaven. That's, we can probably assume, it's not going to be at all in Hades. In fact, C.S. Lewis, who writes a lot of books and kind of talks about death and heaven and even Hades and everything. In The Great Divorce, he's talking about heaven and hell. And one of the ways he paints hell is extreme loneliness. That, that people are always trying to argue with one another and everyone wants to have their way. And in Hades or in hell, everyone gets their own way. And so they just kind of keep isolating themselves further and further away. Now, that's not said in the scriptures, but I think it's probably, we could probably, you know, kind of guess that that's a, probably a pretty accurate picture, extreme isolation and loneliness. Okay, here's something else we know about Hades, and this probably will make us a little uncomfortable, but righteous people are there. Hypocrites, the self-righteous, you know, Matthew 24 uh, verse 51, it says, uh, And we'll cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So a hypocrite, what's a hypocrite? Someone who knows the truth or knows of the truth, but they do something totally different. In fact, Jesus often talked about the Pharisees and the stumbling blocks and the self-righteous as being people who were going to be thrown out of the kingdom into the place of outer darkness. And, uh, 
And so, and by the way, when we talk about religious, we're not talking about someone who is faithful to the word of God and has a relationship with the Lord. We're talking about, we're using that in a, in a more negative term of someone who gives the impression of being spiritual and having a relationship with the Lord, but they're, they're not living it. And that, there's a lot of people who fall in that category, don't they? You know, they're not bearing the fruit. You know, and on the other hand, people who are stumbling blocks, like what did uh, Jesus say about stumbling blocks? He's, you know, he said some pretty harsh things. Like, you know, one of the things he said, you know, every person who makes one of these little ones, talking about children, stumble, you know, uh, he says, it would be better for them if a millstone, which is a big stone block, was tied around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. So, so the thing that Jesus really uh, concerned Jesus were the stumbling blocks, the hypocrites, the self-righteous, uh, the people who are great at pointing the finger, condemning others, you know, had a focus on the technicalities. And so Hades is going to be a place where there's going to be quite a few religious people. And again, I'm using that in a negative sense as meaning hypocrites and stumbling blocks, self-righteous and all that. Okay, another thing we tell about Hades, and we don't have a lot of information about this, but there appears to be greater judgment and condemnation for some people, for those who know and who've heard, but reject Christ or don't respond to him. You know, uh, Matthew 11 you know, um, we won't read the whole passage, but Jesus is talking about, he starts denouncing the cities because they didn't, that he, where most of his miracles were done because they did not repent. And he kind of starts talking about the cities that he was in over and over and over, talking. Cities where there seemed to be a lot of self-righteousness. And he says, it'll be more tolerable for cities like Tyre and Sidon, and even Sodom, than for the cities that Jesus preached in and where they rejected him. You know, uh, verse 24, it says, nevertheless, I think that's the one I have up here. Nevertheless, I say to you, it will be more tolerable from the, for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Now, again, we don't know what all that means, but just as there seems to be some sense of rewards or uh, privileges or added responsibilities for the faithful within the kingdom of heaven and especially as we go at, move into the millennium into the uh, age of the new earth and, and heaven you know there appears to be greater judgment and condemnation for those who know but don't do anything about it and then finally, another thing I think we can say about Hades, Jesus said it's very clear. In fact, he said this in the Sermon on the Mount. Broad is the way that, dis that leads to destruction and narrow is the way that leads to life. In other words, this idea that, oh, God's probably in the end. He, most people, unless they're really wicked, like a Hitler or something, they're going to get in. There is no indication of that in the scriptures. Jesus says, narrow is the way that leads to life, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. Okay, so probably the, you know, that's probably a little bit more sobering, talking about Hades. Present heaven, talking about present heaven, boy, wow, yeah, I can get excited about that. And you might be asking, is it possible to know beforehand, while we're here on this earth, where we're going? And to know with certainty. And the answer is yes. We don't have to kind of wait and hope until we die to find out. And I know that makes good, good story material and cartoons and, you know, and movies and television and books and magazines, but it's not biblical. First John chapter five, verse 13, it says, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, 
so that you may know that you have eternal life. God wanted to make it so simple and so clear that we would know for sure. And one way he does that, he, it's not based upon our works. Because if it was our works, and a lot of people have this idea, you know, well, if my good deeds balance my bad deeds, I guess I'll, I'm okay. And so we go through life. Well, it seems like I'm doing better yet lately or oh, last couple months. No. And we're always kept guessing, aren't we? No, we don't need to be kept guessing because it doesn't have anything to do with our deeds. It has to do with have we trusted Jesus as our Savior and Lord? Do we, have we believed on him? Or John 1, um, 12 says it, I think, really well. But to as many as received him, and that means receive him into his life, receive him as Lord of your life, to them he gave the right to become children of God even to those who believe in his name. And we've talked about this before, but when the scriptures talk about believing, it means more than just an intellectual, oh yeah, I believe that God exists. It means I'm trusting him. Uh, John 3, 16, we all know that verse, or many of us do. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him, that is his son Jesus, shall not perish but have eternal life. John 4, verse 14. Jesus is talking to the woman at the well. And he tells her, you know, he's speaking about the water that I give you, you'll never thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I would give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. John 5, I mean, actually the whole book of John, if you're unsettled or unclear about eternal life, the book of John, I mean, almost every chapter he's talking about eternal life. But John 5, verse 24, it says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him, and again, that Greek word means we're trusting in him, we're committing ourselves to him, Whoever believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death into life. And that's the choice we have, either a life of condemnation and judgment or one of eternal life. And wow, there's so much to explain here. But if you are uncertain about whether or not you have eternal life, and, uh, and maybe the things I kind of talked about a little earlier about, you know, religious people not making it. I encourage you, start looking at the scriptures. Do some soul searching. Start talking to the Lord about this. Um, like I said, there's a lot to explain. I would really recommend, we've written a book called Words of Eternal Life. And it's in English. It's in Spanish. It's... Um, it's, um, here it is right here. It's even in French. You can get it at, it's, it's by the way, it's, it's less than 100 pages, but it explains a lot. And uh, if you look below in the description, you'll see a, a link uh, where you can kind of click. Basically, you can get it in Amazon. Or if you live around here in Frisco, give us a call. We'll be glad to get one of these to you, okay? So, uh, and, and, and again, I just want to encourage you to really consider this because eternal life and this choice that we've talked about today, it affects the rest of eternity for us. And this isn't something that we need to be going through life. I think I'm okay, or I'm hoping I'm okay. No, it's very clear from the scriptures that we can know that we have eternal life. Jesus wants us to know. That's his gift, but we have to receive it. We have to believe him. Okay, so next time we're going to kind of take this a little bit further. We're going to start talking about what happens. Jesus comes back and the millennium. But let's pray. Father, we, uh, we thank you for this present heaven that you have 
that we can be in your presence and we can experience the joy and the peace and all the things that come with your presence, the hope, the light. Lord, we know that a little bit later, there's going to even be more. But Lord, what we know of present heaven, Lord, is something wonderful because it's with you. And uh, so, Lord, we just ask that you would just help us to understand these things, not just in our heads, but in our hearts, that we just are really rooted and grounded in what your word says about heaven, death, even about Hades, because, Lord, we want to make sure that we talk to people about uh, the reality of hell or Hades as well. So, Lord, give us understanding in all these things. Thank you, Lord. Amen. And just one other thing I want to just say again, I encourage you to, this is this could be one of the most important series that you hear, to listen to all of them and to go back. You know what? It's, it's okay if you, because I know I'm just giving a lot of verses and everything every week because there's a lot of material. Like I said, over 500 passages just on heaven. And uh, that there's a lot of material. I know it can be overwhelming, but you can listen to this two, three, four times. Take notes. Write down the scriptures. Go back and look at them because this is a very important thing for us. Okay? See you next week.